Welcome to the Salma Gundy Club. My name is Alexander Catlin. I'm the chairman of the Salma Gundy Library Committee, and I would like to welcome you all. We are honored to have our speaker tonight, and I would like to introduce uh, John Freed, the president of ARC New York, to introduce our speaker. So John, if you would come and say a few words. So I'd like to introduce Dr. Cameron tonight. We are very, very pleased to have her here tonight. Uh, I'd also like to thank the Saul Gundy Club for hosting us. So, uh, Dr. Cameron got her Bachelor of Arts from Bryn Mawr, and she also she got her PhD from University of uh, Pennsylvania. She's been working at Malkata, and she is one of the curators at the Metropolitan Museum's Egyptian Collection. And she's going to be talking tonight on the powerful women of Thebes and the tomb of three princesses at Deir Bahri. So, Dr. Cameron, thank you. Thanks, everybody, so much for coming. And thank you so much, RC New York, for inviting me. It's always so much fun to talk about these things that fascinate me, and I hope everybody else. My topic tonight is Powerful Women of Thebes, the Tomb of the Three Princesses at Deir al-Bahri. And I want to start by welcoming everyone to the Met, because this is material that lives at the Met. And um, I am sure that everyone here spends plenty of time at the Met, yes? <laughs> Yay. So welcome to the Met, um, where we have many galleries with art from the pre-dynastic and the Old Kingdom all the way through the Roman period. And I also want to announce, in case anyone missed it, that this is the Temple of Dendor, <laughs> which is from the Roman period. It is no longer in the Sackler Wing, which mm -hmm. does not mean that it has moved out of the Sackler Wing, but the name has been removed. So we are now calling it, I don't know what, the Temple of Dendor Wing. <laughs> but just wanted to make sure everyone got that announcement. So we're going to be focusing today on late second and early first millennium funerary art, which is one of the things that I'm very interested in, and I'm actually working on a little bit of reorganization of Gallery 126, and, and then a, a big reconfiguration of Gallery 130, which is a study gallery. They both have a lot of funerary art from the late second and early first millennium. And the material I'll be talking about today is to a large extent in those two galleries. So here is a view of the wall in gallery 126 where most of this material lives. And you see here a couple of coffin sets from this tomb. And so I'm going to start by talking about the Egyptian expedition, which began in 1906 and ran until 1936, where the Met sent um, teams of archaeologists and curators to Egypt to excavate to a large extent, not completely, but to a large extent to bring back material through partage in which the Egyptian government would look at whatever had been excavated in that season and divide it and give supposedly half to the excavators and keep the other half for Egypt where it has gone to the, it went to the Egyptian Museum or to storerooms and now it's also going to some of the new museums that they're building in Egypt. So that's, that's going to be a challenge for the next couple of years is figuring out <laughs> where everything has gone off to. Um, and so you see here, my focus today is going to be on the excavations at, um, in ancient Thebes, modern Luxor, on the West Bank, where um, we excavated again from 1906 to some of the, well, really 1910, but from early on until the end of the excavations in Egypt, this was a big focus, was the West Bank, the necropolis um, at ancient Thebes. And there's the Theban team, I think it's in like 19... Five or something. There is Herbert Winlock who led these excavations for most, he wasn't the only um, expedition leader, but he did most of the excavations. And uh, it is his work that I'm going to be talking about today. Just a word about sources. So Winlock and his team published a great deal. They published every year. They would publish um, in the Metropolitan Museum of Arts bulletin and they would publish very 
much overviews of what they had accomplished during the season, what their major finds were. It's, a, it's really fun to read these accounts. They're very chatty and maybe a little colonial from our point of view now, but for the time they were, they were really fun. And then in some cases they went on to publish more detailed, thorough publications, but in some cases not. So, for example, the material I'm talking about today hasn't been published in depth when Luck didn't, didn't get to do that. So what we have at the Met is we have these wonderful, amazing archives. And so you see here some of the kinds of material that we have. We have a big series of archival photos. Um, they're mostly taken by Harry Burton, the photographer for Tutankhamun. And we have a lot of them, and they're great. They give us a lot of information. And then we have some sketch plans, which you see if we move over to the left. You see the sort of greeny gray thing. They have wonderful drawings and plans of things. And then the excavation notes, the field notes themselves are, um, so yes, on the right are, and so we have these things called, we call them tomb cards, and there are a whole series of them, sometimes <coughs> handwritten, sometimes typed with wonderful drawings. They would copy the inscriptions, and they're just really fantastic uh, resources. And then we also have some unpublished manuscripts, which where Winlock and other people tried to put together some of these notes. So most of what I'm talking about today, the information comes from the bulletin and, and these notes. And other publications over the years because this material has been known to scholars for many years. So just a brief introduction to ancient Thebes, which is where we are located tonight as a ceremonial stage. Um, it was sacred to the god Amun, was kind of the king of the gods and the king of the area, and he was worshipped there with uh, his wife Mut, the goddess Mut, and their son Kansu. So here we just kind of have the divine triad that oversaw the area. And so there were temples, big temples on the, how many people here have not been to Egypt yet? Okay. All right, you're going to want to go. <laughs> okay, so on the east bank, you have major temples at um, Karnak and Luxor. And then on the west bank, you also have the memorial temples of the uh, pharaohs and also that are in combination with divine temples. And there are, actually, there are divine temples there too. And so this is this big sacred landscape where there were these festivals and these processions where uh, cult images would be carried from Luxor Temple to Karnak Temple and back, and then across the Nile in these, um, probably in these ceremonial boats, and we have these bark stands where, where they would have rested them across the river to visit the temples on the West Bank. So it's a whole big um, magical stage for cult. We're going to focus today on the site of Deir al-Bahri. You see its location here, and it's very adjacent to the Valley of the Kings, which I think everyone knows is where the kings of the New Kingdom were buried, and where Tutankhamun, a centennial, was buried. And you can see the Nile is over on the right, and we're, in the, we're on the west bank, so it's the land of the setting sun um, where the cemeteries were out in the desert. And here's a wonderful, I decided to leave the copyright Ken Garrett there so we could all admire Ken's photography, which I use frequently. Um, and it just, it just shows you how, how adjacent Deir al-Bahri is to the Valley of the Kings. It's just right over the hill, so they're, they're closely connected. And um, Deir al-Bahri was also sacred to the goddess Hathor, a very, very important, powerful goddess seen in some um, iterations as the mother of the sun god Ray. She's just a very, very important goddess, and this whole bay of cliffs, and you can really see it in this picture. You can see how this is this wonderful bay, this setting for temples and for cult, and for tombs. There are many tombs in this area going back to the Old Kingdom at least, and then through the rest of Egyptian history. And here you see another view of the bay of cliffs, and the two temples you see here where the Met excavated at both of these temples. The Met didn't discover these temples, but, they, but we excavated there. So dating from about 2000 BCE, 
we have um, the temple of Neb Hepetre Mentuhotep II, who is the unifier of the two lands at the end of the second intermediate period, introducing the Middle Kingdom. And then um, you can see next to, next to that the temple of Hatshepsut, dating from about 1500 BCE. So this is the early New Kingdom. And these are very important temples. And again, the Met did a lot of excavations there. So, so this is to just give you the setting in space, is what this little part of the talk is about. And now I'm just going to set you in time. So we have just a little timeline here with the Old Kingdom, the Middle Kingdom, again, that's Nepepid Raymentuhotep, the New Kingdom with Tutankhamun, and then the Greco-Roman period, we have Cleopatra VII. Where we're going to be in time today is in the Third Intermediate Period. So this is around 1000 BCE. And, um, and we're going to be focused on the 21st dynasty, which is the first dynasty of the Third Intermediate Period. So this is, a, this is a period when Egypt was divided between rulers at Tanis in the north and at Thebes in the south. And it's, <coughs> this was a period where there was um, both conflict but also intermarriage, and there was a close a close relationship between the Tanite kings, who were the official, official kings, and the high priests of Amun, who had a lot of power and really controlled the, the southern part of the country. And you see here, um, so at Tanis, the kings, the Tanite kings were buried there in these amazing tombs that don't get nearly enough play, but um, um, that were found intact in the 1940s, and they had gold, and they were buried in a temple precinct. So, and then we have um, material from the south at Thebes. So, Winlock was very interested in finding material from this period. He knew um, earlier, in the late 1800s, there had been these two amazing finds. The first royal cache, which is in, actually in a valley just kind of over to the left from Deir al-Bahri, was this huge shaft tomb and this was an incredible find and there are wonderful stories, interesting stories about it where um, some of the local people apparently stumbled across this tomb and started but didn't tell anybody and started removing things little by little and they appeared on the art market and over time the antiquity service figured out that something was up because there was royal material and what was in this cache were the burials of a number of the high priests and their immediate families from the 21st dynasty, but also many of the most important New Kingdom pharaohs who had been collected by the, um, the authorities in the, early, in the early Third Intermediate period and hidden here, probably stripped of a lot of things, and there's, that's a whole other story that we're not going to get into, but what's important is this was a cash tomb. It was where both the families of the high priest and all these New Kingdom pharaohs were buried, were hidden. Um, and then the antiquity service came along and got everything out in something like three days. So we don't have great records from, from that, but we have a lot of very important and interesting material. And then over in, if you see the red arrow, is pointing to what we call the, the Baba Gusus, which is, means the gate of the priests. And this is a huge, um, shaft and corridor tomb that had 153 assemblages, 153 people belonging to the family, not necessarily the immediate family, in general a little bit lower status, but part of this family that controlled this whole area, <coughs> belonging to the priesthood of Amun, which was, remember Amun from a couple slides back, the gold statue? So this is, these are the people that are controlling the area, and these are where they're buried for the most part in the first royal cache for the top, tippy top, and then one click down and a little bit later in the Babo Gusu. So Winlock knew that there was something up in this area and he wanted to find more wonderful 21st Dynasty material and third intermediate per period material for the Met's collection. So he set about looking. Um, so just another word about the high priest of Amun at Thebes, because I want to just kind of introduce you to the family because we're going to be meeting these princesses. So I want to introduce you to the family briefly. Um, 
So again, locating you in space. And so this is the family of Pionk, whose funerary stela is here. Um, but we're going to skip over him because he's complicated and everybody's changing their mind about exactly when the order of things. But his son, Pinejem I, is the first high priest of Amun controlling this area in the 21st dynasty. So we're going to focus on um, Pionk's family starting with Pinejem I. And I just show you here that they're, again, that they're controlling the um, cult of Amun both on the east bank and on the west bank. So on the top there you have the temple at Karnak on the east bank, and in the bottom you have the temple of Medina at Habu, built by Ramses III in the um, New Kingdom on the west bank. So here we are at the first royal cache. I just thought I'd show you some pictures, because a lot of what I'm going to be talking about for the next couple of minutes is information and material that comes from this. So you see here an archival, or a sketch of them taking all the things out. And here is some of what they found, all of these coffins and all of these people that really allow us to know a lot more about this period. So we get some information from inscriptions and, and reliefs in temples, and then we get a lot of information from, from this tomb, because we have a lot of, you know, we have Pinejem the first, we have Pinejem the second, we have a lot of the queens and some of the princesses and, and than other high priests. So, and they come not just with coffins and coffin sets, because at this period, as you'll see, you have usually two coffins and a mummy board, but they've got shabtis and they've got funerary papyri and all sorts of interesting things. And I've decided to use shabtis because we have a number of shabtis from the first royal cache in our collection. So I thought I would use them to illustrate the family tree. So now everybody has to remember complicated names, which are very annoying also because they liked to repeat their names. So it's like, so when you have a high priest, you can have a number, a one or a two, if you have the same name. If you're not a high priest or a king, you get an alpha, A, B, C, D, E. So uh, it sounds more complicated as, than it is, but in some cases I'm going to be throwing numbers and letters around. So. Um, so here we go. So we have Panajim the first, and his wife Dua Hator Henatawi, who is known as Henatawi A, very powerful. Lots of really fancy titles, and um, I didn't draw lines because it made it look messy, and also because um, we don't always know who people's mothers are. Like we know all these people were sons and daughters of Panajim the first, but we don't necessarily always know for sure who their mother is. And in general, in this family. Figuring out exactly who was, who was related how is sometimes a little complicated. But here we go. So we have um, children of Pinejo the I. We have another high priest, Masaharta. And then he's succeeded by his brother, Menkepere. And interestingly enough, you see no Shabti for Menkepere because we haven't found his tomb yet. There's a chance that it's out of Eidos. But it hasn't been found yet. And he ruled for like 50 years. So it would be really nice to find his tomb. That would be just fascinating. So but people are looking for it. Um, and then their daughter, then his daughter Matkare, who was a god's wife of Amun, which was like the top of the um, priesthood. And then actually a Tanite king, sort of the next Tanite king in the sequence, Susanes I was also a son of Pinejem the first. So Pinejem and his family really controlled the whole area. And Pinejem also styled himself a king after about 16 years. He actually puts his name in a cartouche and seems to also be considered a king. OK, so that was generations one and two counting from Pinejem the first. Is everybody with me with all these fancy names? <laughs> You can say no. <laughs> um, so then you have the next generation. We just kind of skip over Masaharta because you know he didn't rule for very long. Menkepere is the next big news. And one of his principal wives is Isetemkheb C, because we've had A and B already, which we just skipped over them, because it can't introduce you to everybody. Um, so then the next generation after that, Menkepere's son, Pinejem II, and his other son, Smendes II, um, both become high priests. 
Smendes does not seem to have ruled for very long. We don't have his tomb. We don't know very much about him. Panegem II, he was buried in the first royal cache. We have his um, coffin. We have his burial assemblage. And so we know a lot more about him. And he, and he ruled for quite some time as well. So that's generations two and three. Okay, and then three and four, so we have Pinegem II, and we know of at least two principal wives of Pinegem II. We have Nessi Kansu and Isetempeb D, because we had C and now we have D. And um, it's interesting because both Nessi Kansu and Isetempeb D were buried in the first royal cache. We have their coffins. Nessi Kansu appears to have died when she was quite young. Um, perhaps in childbirth. Her coffins are much earlier in style, and dating 21st Dynasty coffins by style is a whole thing. <laughs> but all the people, and everybody disagrees with each other, and there's a whole lot of reuse going on, which really complicates the whole issue. But everyone seems to agree that Nessie Kansu's coffins are significantly earlier than Asetem Kheb D's, except Nessie Kansu was using a coffin set that was originally made for Isetem Kebdi. So the, all sorts of stories have been made about, about these people. Um, one, one scholar of this period wrote an article about how Pinejem II was married to Isetem Keb, and then Nessie Kansu came along, and so he divorced Isetem Keb. And then he married Nessie Kansu, but then she died. And so then he married Isetem Keb again. Anyway, who knows? We know that they were both, um, both his wives and and Nessie Kansu is a whole story in and of herself. And then we know a little bit about um, their children. We're getting to the end of the 21st dynasty now and the end of, the, of this line of high priests, but we do know some of their children, one of whom is um, Susanis, the high priest. I forgot to put the HBA. Susanis, the third, and maybe he's the same as the king at Tanis, Susanis the second. Again, this is one of those things that blood is spilled over, and I'm not going to go there. <laughs> anyway, we're sort of getting to the end of the dynasty, so we'll just move on. Okay, so Winlock comes into this um, complicated situation, and he wants to find some wonderful things for the Met's collection, for which we thank him very much, and we thank especially the Egyptian government for being so generous, because really, the Met's collection is a, about over 60% of it came to us through Partage, not just from our excavations, but from other excavations where we um, helped pay for them and then got things or, or purchased things from the excavators. So it's really wonderful, and this, it's, it speaks to the generosity of the system, which fortunately is, has been over. Um, no longer do that, but the Met has wonderful pieces because of this. Okay, so Winlock starts searching near the Babel Gusus. What else would you do, right? That makes perfect sense. Um, so, and there's a, this triangular area that's that's created by the Mentu Hotep forecourt makes this big swooshy thing here. And so there's this like triangular area there um, where the Babel Gusus is, and Winlock starts looking there, and he is successful. He finds a series of tombs from the third intermediate period. So I'm going to let him speak now. So he says, in the center of the courtyard of Hatshepsut's temple, so we didn't get there yet, sorry. So he finds something in the middle of the, of the courtyard. He finds a tomb, but it's empty. And, and there's newspaper in it from 1892. So somebody's been there before him. It's too late. And I, ha I have to say, my first excavation in Egypt, which was at Abydos with David O'Connor, and um, I, one of my exciting finds, because I was re-clearing something that we all knew had been cleared before, but I found a, a part of a cigarette package from like maybe 1900. It was actually quite nice. <laughs> anyway, um, so he said, fortunately for our spirits, however, we had already begun to clear away the big mound on the north side of the courtyard, never touched in modern times. We were finding piles of stone chips quarried out of tombs later than the 18th dynasty temple. Drum roll. So I thought I'd show you the big, big pile of stone chips. Can you imagine? And, and didn't use a bulldozer. Now people use bulldozers, but no bulldozer. So there's the, and then also just to situate you in space, because you can see there the big pile of chips, and you can see the Hatshepsut temple in the background. So you get an idea of where we are. 
Winlock again. The area where the north wall of Hatshepsut's court met the rock cutting of Mentuhotep's court with its field stone revetment wall became a sort of blind alley excellently adapted for hidden tombs. In fact, this had been realized as early as Hatshepsut's own days by a certain Minmos, possibly one of the engineers charged with transporting her obelisks from Aswan to Karnak. He had cut a deep pit into the rock with a burial crypt at the bottom. There he had lain until tomb robbers found its hiding place and utterly destroyed it leaving the pit gaping open. So you can see here, there's a red arrow, arrow pointing to the number 59. So this is tomb MMA 59, and this was the first intact tomb that Winlock found. And you can see that it's in this, in this triangular area. There it had stood when in the 21st dynasty, the family of a lady named Henetawi the first of, well, actually the second. Do you guys remember Dua Hathor Hanatawi? So, um, a lady named Hanatawi had brought her body to the necropolis to bury her. They laid her in Minmos's empty crypt, blocked up the door with stone and bits of his broken coffins, and filled up the pit with rubbish. And there she lay undisturbed for 3,000 years. I'm not convinced the tomb was originally Minmos's, but it was definitely used for Hanatawi. And you see her outer coffin here, and we have. Um, it's a very interesting assemblage in and of itself. And here it is. It is one of our masterpieces. It is in um, Gallery 126. We call her Hanatawi F. Yeah, she's way down in the alphabet here. But um, it, and it's interesting because it's a really, really beautiful, well done set, but it's not top quality. And she, her only title is um, Chantress of Amun. So she wasn't high up in the, arc, um, in the hierarchy. She was kind of middling there, but it's a wonderful set. She also didn't have any other material. Her assemblage consisted of the coffin set, at least when she was found. Oh. So the next tomb he opened was only about six feet away. You see it again here in this with the red arrow. This is tomb MMA 60. So now we finally get to the main, the main topic here. Okay, again, here's the location in bird's eye view. And just another view uh, looking towards the floodplain. And then again, I'm going to let Winlock describe the excavation. <laughs> it was a shallow, sloping hole cut in the rock, leading to an opening closed with a wooden door um, just under the surface. And thieves easily dug down to it. They only made a little burrow, barely wide enough to crawl through, as you see here. But this was still standing open when one of the rare torrential rains burst on the hills above. The roaring floods then poured down over the cliffs, and they swirled down the open robber's hole into the depths of this tomb. Digging here became one of the most ticklish jobs which has ever fallen to our thought in Thebes. Within the doorway, there was a sharply sloping passage, quarried in the rock, which had become entirely choked with water-washed sand and gravel of cement-like hardness. Our men chopped through it with pickaxes, but the tight packed sand was all that still held up the soft rock rotted by the ancient flood and the roof kept caving away above them. Here I'm showing you a plan of the tomb. This is redrawn by our artist, Sarah Chen, from the um, original plans drawn by Winlock's team. And you can see there the entrance corridor over on the right. So we come down the sloping corridor and then it ends up in a pit and from the pit is a chamber and I'll show you that in more detail in a little bit. I'm just going to point out quickly, like everything at Thebes, it was reused later. So the idea was maybe it was originally this 18th dynasty tomb used in the 21st dynasty. And then new chambers were cut into it in the Sayite period about in the 26th dynasty. So a bit later, um, you know, maybe about 400 years later, uh, cut into here. And you can see that there's a whole series of Sayite um, chambers and here there were four 26 dynasty assemblages found or tombs tombs coffins coffin sets and then some other stuff this is the one piece that we have in the museum this is a stele of Nessie Kansu not the same as Queen Nessie Kansu this is a priest of the Sayite period and then also some um, other material of Tasso Gorosiris and things from a bead net from a mummy, which again are from a later period. And this was all filling the corridor. It was a big mess. 
So this is a view into the pit. And this pit was filled with fill. And then at the bottom were broken up coffins and other parts of funerary assemblages. And so you see it here cleared with just one of the coffins left. This is the coffin of a priestess named T. So just to look down, and there's these cool steps on the side. And I would love to see what it actually looks like. And I've gone hunting at Deir al-Bahri. I've gone hunting to try to find tombs 59 and 60. And I think I know where they are, but they're not, they're not accessible anymore. So once Winlock had finished excavating the pit, he was able to retrieve material from six different burials. So there was a lot of material there. But then over in that corner where you see the arrow, there was the opening to a chamber. And so here we go into the chamber. So this was all blocked up with rubble and all sorts of things. And then when they cleared some of the rubble, they, they found a coffin that had been jammed in there because they couldn't get it all the way into the chamber. And when they removed that, they found this. They found two layers of coffins. You can see two are just laid up on top. And then down at the bottom, there's a close up. And there you see with the top layer of coffins removed, there are four coffins left. And Winlock's reconstruction of the situation here was that the three coffins on the right were put in there first, and those are the three princesses. So we'll be looking at them in more detail. So those are the three princesses, and then this is a, a priest named Menkhepere. And um, so his reconstruction was that they were buried there, and then they came in with Menkhepere, and then they came in with other people, and then they would throw other people into the pit. And So he thinks it was this whole family tomb that was just reused over time. I'm not sure that the reconstruction holds up. I am of the, I'm leaning towards the opinion that it was also a cache tomb, um, which doesn't mean people wouldn't have been put in there at different times. So for example, with the first royal cache, we know that Nessi Kansu and Pinejem II were put in at different times because they're inscriptions that, that tell us that. But in general, um, this looks more like a, a cache tomb and his reconstruction doesn't quite hold up. Although I hate to argue with the excavator because you know you know a lot more when you're actually doing the excavation. So over on the right, that's Henatawi, and she's B, as we'll find out. And then Jed Mutasank, and then Henatawi C, and then Menkhepere. And we're just going to meet all of them in more detail. So again, there were six assemblages in the pit and six assemblages in the chamber, and I'm just showing you quickly a coffin from each of them, and also a fun fact, which is, remember the Baba Gusus, mm -hmm. the gate of the priests where there were 153 people? Winlock used the Baba Gusus as a storeroom, because all those 153 people and other stuff got taken out and taken to Cairo and given to people all over the world. That's, a, again, a, another topic altogether. <laughs> but um, Winlock used the Baba Gusus for storage, and then um, Andre Nowinski, a scholar of this period in the 70s, found Winlock's storage and, and published a short article, but he included line drawings of some of the coffins that he found, and, and I was able to match those up with Winlock's notes to see which, which assemblages they were. And one of our, there were a number that were anonymous, that the coffins didn't have names on them that could be read, and from Nowinski's um, notes, we were able to give a name to one of our anonymous men. So there were eight women and four men. A brief review of the elements of a complete 21st dynasty assemblage, because it's fun. So you've got the mummy wrapped, and there's a whole, you can have you know, 13 layers, you can have all sorts of layers of wrapping. And um, Winlock unwrapped the mummies, the ones that he was able to, which again, we would not do today, but he recorded it very carefully, he videotaped, um, some of the unwrapping, and he took detailed notes of exactly how many shirts and bandages and everything was there. Um, and then there were amulets on some of the bodies, so I show you some of those. One of the outer, in some of the cases, there was a, what we call an Osiris shroud as the outermost layer. So that's a figure of the god Osiris labeled with the name of the deceased person. 
because the deceased person becomes an Osiris. This is not a talk about funerary religion, but that's a basic thing when you are transformed into one of the divinized dead, uh, your body must become like that of Osiris. Viscera figures. So we are used to thinking of four packages of canopic material. Um, so you have your lungs, liver, stomach, and intestines, your viscera. All of these guys had seven packages. I don't know. But they always had four canopic figures, because you only have four canopic genie. But they all had seven packages. And even one of them had fake packages, so they really cared that there were seven. I don't know. Another topic. <laughs> Nested coffins. Okay, so you have a bigger outer coffin, a mummy board. We're out of sync here, sorry. From left to right, mummy board goes on top of the mummy. Um, mummy goes inside the inner coffin. Lid gets placed on top. And then you put the whole thing in an outer coffin. So a full 21st Dynasty coffin set has these three elements, actually five. But you get an Osiris figure. These are these wooden figures. And you usually get two papyri. So one papyrus will be rolled up, they'll be, both be rolled up, one, one would be placed between the legs of the mummy inside the coffin, and the other would be inside the Osiris figure. And you would have a Book of the Dead with some selected spells from the Book of the Dead, and what we call an Amduat papyrus, which have to do with the hours of the night. Then Shabti boxes, and Shabtis, and Shabtis are these funerary figurines that are like little avatars for the deceased that will work on, be, they're labeled the illuminated, whatever the person is, Hanatawi, that is Hanatawi, um, and they are, they are images of the deceased, but they're also um, meant to work on the deceased behalf in the afterlife, and you would have a full complement of Shaktis is about 401, so you have one for every day of the year, and those are mummiform, and then you have overseer Shaktis who wear a kilt and carry a whip, and they're one for every 10 um, shabtis for one, one a week. Okay, men versus women, fun facts, how to tell the difference between a man and a man's coffin and a woman's coffin. So men wear these striped wigs, whereas women tend to have these flat colored wigs with uh, hair jewelry of some sort, you know, holding, the, holding down here. Um, let's see, women have breasts, Men often hold, uh, men often have beards, not always, and it's, try to figure out which beard goes where. You can't, it's very inconsistent. Um, men fist their hands and sometimes hold amulets of, sort, of a sort in them. Um, women put their hands flat. Again, women have, have breasts and men don't. And those are the major differences, but Kara Cooney has taken this and just really run with it. There's so much reuse and we have reuse. She's looked at our coffins um, preliminarily. There's a lot of reuse. It, it gets very complicated, but you know, you'll have in some cases where you can see that one name has been rubbed off and another name has been put on. We think in a lot of cases this was done within families. They weren't stealing each other's coffins. This was somehow an a, a agreement, a social agreement. Again, topic for another time, um, but Go listen to Kara whenever she talks about it. It's just fascinating. The other interesting thing in Tomb 60 about men versus women is that women have the stuff. In Tomb 60, now three of our women are very, very high status, as we'll see in a minute. Um, but some of them are just chantresses of Amun. They don't seem to have the same kind of status. But they've got stuff. The men, nothing. Less wrappings. They don't have all this extra stuff, papyri or anything like that. My guess is that it has to do with status, but um, there are people studying the larger picture about this. Um, then we'll see, what, we'll see what they have to say. Also, you may have noticed that many of the coffins I've been showing you have no faces. So a lot of the, in Tomb 60, it's mainly the women. They would have been gilded. The, the faces, the hands, the, in some cases the breasts, were gilded, and so ancient tomb robbers took the gilded pieces away, presumably to melt them down for reuse or for sale or whatever. But this happened in ancient times. This is how Winlock found them. And again, the men look, look better now because they still have their faces, but it's because they didn't have gold. 
brief run through, the, here are the four men, two from the chamber, two from the pit. Um, not very high status, he was um, the priest of Amun. Tabakhmut here has no titles, and he has a women's name, but he has a man's coffin and a man's body, another mystery for another time. And then two anonymous ones, that's the one that, that we think his name was Ankefia. Um, and then the women. So these are some of the women. These are the lower status women who are all interesting in their own right, especially um, Gout Session there in the middle, one of the women that was found in the pit because she seems to have been murdered. Mm -hmm. was hit in the head. So she's another story. And now we get to the princesses. So our first princess is Henatawi, daughter of Pineja. So she was really a high priest high priestess princess. So she died when she was about 50, and we see here her coffins and her mummy, and um, the rest of her assemblage here. We have her Shabti box, and for complicated reasons, we have her Osiris figure too, because Winlock mixed them up. Henetawi B, as the daughter of Panejem, and kind of the most important of the assemblages in the excavator's eyes and the Egyptian's eyes, was supposed to go to, to Cairo. And it did, except as I, the Shabti box, for some reason, we kept, and they, switched, they mixed up the Osiris figures with one of the other ladies. So, um, but that's Henatawi B. So she was the daughter of Pinejem, and I think I have, yes. So just to show you, so on her coffin, it says, daughter of the king, and her father's name, Pinejem, in cartouches. Now, you remember there are two Pinejems. <coughs> Most people agree, or everyone I've talked to agree that this would be Pinejem the first because of the style of her coffins is, is earlier. So we assume that she's the, um, the daughter of Pinejem the first. And we also have, she appears on this relief from Karnak where you see her father and she's there with two of her sisters. So. Um, so we're pretty sure she's the daughter of Panenjem the first. And so I put her into our Shabti family tree. Um, you see again Panenjem the first, and you see she, there she is with a red box around her. So she seems to be the, the daughter of Panenjem the first, and I've also just thrown in for good measure one of our other assemblages, which is Nani, who also is probably, maybe, not so much agreement on that, another daughter of Pinejem the first that we also have um, in the gallery. Okay, so then just showing you her assemblage, again with the Shabti box that um, one, of, one of our long-term projects is to take these Shabtis that Winlock excavated from Tomb 60 and, and inventory them and label them and then Gustavo gets to photograph each, each one of them separately <laughs> because they were, they were um, accessioned as a group. So now we have to like count all 400 of them. We haven't touched her, we haven't opened her box yet. <laughs> so it's a little, it's a little terrifying, um, especially because the first box we opened had at least one Shabdi of somebody else's in it. So I just imagine night at the museum where they jump out and, and run around and then so, <laughs> we'll see what happens when we go into Henatawi B's Shabdi box. Okay, so just again to show you, so that's Henatawi B's assemblage in C2. And now we're going to skip over the middle one and go to Henatawi C. So here's Henatawi C's assemblage, which did come to the Met. And so you see it here, we have the mummy, the mummy board, um, and by the way, the mummies, as I mentioned, were unwrapped, and um, the heads went to Harvard. So, so studying them will be another really um, interesting project, which uh, Salima will be part of at some point, because mo all of our, mo almost all of our human remains went to the Harvard Peabody Museum. So just a little information there. So we have, um, she had amulet, she had a heart scarab, she had viscera figures, she had the seven packages. Um, her Shabti box is all finished. So if you go online, you can see 300 odd pictures of Shabtis taken by, well actually double because you took the front and the back. So if you need to see a lot of Shabtis, you can come to the Met website. And she had two papyri, 
Okay, and yeah. on her coffin, she calls herself. Uh, she was so I didn't talk too much about Hanatawi B's titles. She had high titles, but not super fantastic titles. So Hanatawi C um, was a she was a um, divine mother of Kansu, which is very high, very interesting title. She was a singer of the choir of Mut. Uh, she was a chantress of Amun. And she was also a um, great chief of the Henner of Amun Re. So this is a very interesting title and a very important title. Henner is a very interesting term that has been talked about. It's one of those interesting titles that was often translated as harem in the past, and sometimes people still do, but there's been a lot of literature about this where they, um, it's clear that it has to do with music, and so generally we either leave it untranslated now or translate it as musical troupe. Henetawi Si was great chief of the Henner of Amun. Etzet Emcheb Si was the first great chief of the principal Henner of Amun, so she was even higher. And from what we can tell, this was probably the top of the Theban clergy during this period. Um, we're pretty sure that it said that Menchepere, because right here we have this brick, and it says Menchepere on one side, on the right side, and Esetemcheb on the left side. So we think, again, this is not a, a slam dunk here, but we think that this Esetemcheb that um, was the mother of our Henetawi, those names are really hard, <laughs> um, was the, one of the principal wives of Menchepere. And again, we don't have her burial assemblage. We don't. <gasps> okay, um, so, but let's put her in the family tree. So we think, we think that she is the daughter of Menchepere and Esetem Chepsi, and therefore the sister of Panyanjum II, the two high priests. So very high status, um, and there she is. She dies. 60 to 75, you know, they can't really tell. And just another word, just about, just about the role that women seem to have played in, um, in, the, in the cult, which is most of the titles that we see, although not all of them, again, is, um, Henetawi is Divine Mother of Kansu, but most of the titles that we see, Chantress of Amun, uh, Singer in the Choir of Mut, Flautist, she's also a, a flautist, flutist, um, have to do with music, and music was as far as we can tell, very, very important in the celebration of cult. This helped to call the um, divinity down into the temple, into the cult statue. So um, this, is, this image there is actually from our other Henetawi, Henetawi F. Remember her from 259? Everybody got that straight? So I just put that there because it's a nice image. Of course, she's, so she's playing her sistrum, which is one of the important musical instruments that we know that they used. Um, that is not Amun Re, that is Osiris because it's on a coffin. And there is that title, the great chief of the Henner of Amun. Okay, and then finally we get to my personal favorite, Jen Mutasan, who is in the middle there. So again, Winlock thought they put them in in order, but Jet Mutasan's coffin is really a lot later, or significantly later in style, so it just seems odd that they would have put them in one, two, three. But she's also on some <coughs> boards that they could have slid her in on. So maybe they did put her in later and they just slid her on those boards. Oh, I forgot to say, Henetawi um, C's coffins, minus the mummy board, went to Boston. So we no longer have the full assemblage. Boston has some of Henetawi <coughs> C, in case you want to go look at her coffins. Here is Jen Muta Sank's assemblage. And again, you can see all three princesses are missing their faces, so they were all gilded, all very high status. And there again, you can see she has this full assemblage um, with the mummy board, the inner coffin, the outer coffin, the Osiris figure that went to Cairo by accident. She has had two funerary papyri, one of which was never unrolled. so. Um, but presumably was a, a Book of the Dead. Shabti box and Shabtis, which again, we still have to count. Um, and amulets, including these wonderful gold amulets you see all the way on the right there, which, which say Jed Mut Jed Yib. And 
Winlock decided that that was some kind of play on her name because she's Jedmut S. Ankh, and this is Jedmut Jedyeb. So, um, but they both have to do with Mut, again, closely connected to the Theban triad. So Jedmut S. Ankh um, was a first great chief of the principal Henner of Amun. So she was, as far as we can tell, just at the top of the Theban clergy. She has a string of titles. You see all this? You can't read it because it's tiny, because there's a lot of titles. She has a really long string of titles, some of which are completely unique, um, and including Setem priest of the Amun domain of Ramses III, which is Medinat Habu, which was um, an interesting place during the Third Intermediate Period. It was the center for cult. There's an actual Amun temple there, which you see on the bottom, that was built in the 18th dynasty. Um, and it also was a center for, at least later in the Third Intermediate Period, it was a center for mortuary work. And there were a lot of people buried there later on. She's, and also the fact that she's a Setem, or actually a Setemet, the priest, priestess, is very unusual. It's a male title. and. All of the other princesses and all of the other women, I think, well, at least the other princesses, all have the title Nevet Pair, which means lady of the house or housemistress, which is thought to mean that they were probably married or ran a household. Well, she doesn't have that title, which may just mean it wasn't important enough for her because she had all these other titles and there just wasn't room, or that she wasn't a lady of the house. We don't know, and the other thing we don't know, in contrast to the two Hanatawis, is we have we don't really know where she fit into the family of the high priests. We know she must have been part of the immediate family. She doesn't mention anybody else here. She's standing on her own, so I really like her. So I put her kind of off on the side here for now because was she another? Some people think she was another wife of Pinejem II. Maybe she was a daughter. Um, there's actually. Uh, one theory that she might have been the daughter of one of the Tanite kings. So we don't know. She's a mystery lady, but she was she was very powerful. So we end with the the top of the the Theban female clergy here. Okay. So then just just a little view to bring you back into the museum and also into some of the other museums that you could visit. Neset Aset, one of the other um, coffin sets, is actually in the Walters Art Gallery on very, very long-term loan. And then again, Henantawi C's coffins are in Boston, but the rest, and then Henantawi B is in Cairo, but the rest of them are at the Met. I invite you to come visit the princesses in person and their friends anytime. And again, mostly in our coffin gallery. And then I just want to say thank you very much for um, everyone that, that's helped with this research, including Fen Fong Ho. <laughs> Fen Fong was, was it, and is now a graduate student, but she was an intern, and so she got to play with some of this material with me when she was at the Met. So, so thank you to um, my colleagues in the department, to the American Research Center, and to some of the colleagues that are studying this material with me or have done work that I'm really building on. So. We have time for uh, some questions, right, right, if you... Yeah? I noticed that in referring to high priests, you often use the word ruler. Now, mm -hmm. my understanding that would be ruler of the clergy, correct? Not ruler of the state as a king. There was a, these are separate power structures, is that and right? At this, in this period, yes and no. And again, at least two of these guys, Pinejem the first and Mancapare, style themselves as kings. They put their... their names and cartouches, but they clearly are controlling. They have the power, not just the, the, the power of the, over the cult, but they, they're also, you know, the first ones, they also um, have military titles and they're, you know, but they are ruling the south of Egypt okay. during well, this period. At the time there is a king and a high priest, what would be the relationship? Would the high priest be sort of a spiritual advisor the way the clergy is today to a king? No, they were ruling. They were, they were they ruling were, like a They king. were controlling. I would, I mean, that's my understanding, and that's, that's what comes through in the, in the records, and there are, you know, they, they act like, and, and year dates are given usually, and it's an assumption also, because a lot of times you get, you get year dates. So, so the way that the Egyptians um, recorded time was by the reigns of the kings. And during this period, you have a lot of inscriptions that have year dates, 
but they don't say whose year date it is in a lot of cases. In some cases they say, and it's a Tanite king. In some cases they say, and it's a high priest. In a lot of cases they don't say, and the assumption is usually, well, that would be a Tanite king. Don't get me started on chronology. Because, no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, know that they were really, um, you know, they, they had armies, they were, they were rulers. Uh, Janice, one of the things you explained was that Egypt had split into two kingdoms at this point, and that the, um, the priests, as you were just talking about, had in essence become the rulers of the southern section of Egypt. Does this coincide with uh, a change in burial customs where they stopped packing tombs full of stuff? Because one of the things I noticed is, as you said, the assemblages were the coffins, a couple of uh, accessories and nothing else. No furniture, no clothing, no boxes of jewels. Right. So let me just back up for sure. one second. And so for most of this period, I will say that the high priests are paying lip service to the Tanit kings. They're, they're, they're not completely off on their own, but there are periods where there's conflict. So there, there are power struggles. So I just, it's complicated. Um, but they really do seem to have the power, even if they're saying, OK, well, you're the kings. Um, but then to get to your, your question, yes. OK, so this is a period where they, they are no longer uh, having above ground tomb chapels. Some people think that that's because they carried out cult in the actual temples themselves that were related to the tombs. But that they're buried in, um, and again, whether they were buried someplace else and then gathered up into caches in some cases, we're not sure. But, but in the royal cache, again, we know at least two people there were put in during specific years of a Tanite king, I will say. Um, they were put into the, the royal cache, which are, which are underground. This is the subterranean, um, not where you would be carrying out the, the funerary cult. They don't have that part of it. They seem to be moving a lot of the, um, the things that they need to be transformed, because a lot of the decoration of tomb chapels has to do with uh, being transformed and having eternal offerings, and a lot of this is transferred onto the coffins themselves. The decoration, we didn't get to do any close looking at coffins, but it gets very complicated and very dense. Um, and that's, so you have that, and also onto those papyri. Is this uh, reflective of the economic crisis that was going on at the time at all, do you think? Yes, most likely. And again, the reuse, uh, the, the thought is that um, they didn't have access to wood from abroad. They had to use what they had. And this was, once you were put in your coffin and the transformed into a divinized being, somebody else could use your coffin for the transformation. So this was also a way of getting around scarcity. That's, that's the, the Egyptological opinion as I understand it. Quick question. Uh, talking about conservation for the next generation, mm -hmm. uh, what can you share in terms of new technology that the Med is, uh, especially for this um, princess uh, that are doing that is a state, probably state of the art conservation techniques that you can share with us in terms of thinking in the future? Yeah, absolutely. I am very fortunate um, to have uh, wonderful partners in conservation. Um, Anna Serrata is our objects conservator. And she and her, she has um, a fellow who's been with her for two years named Ahmed Tarek, who's from Egypt, um, are working with me. We, we call it our coffin project. And we're basically taking all of the first millennium coffins and doing, and with our imaging studio, we have wonderful photographers as well as Gustavo in our department, uh, taking full photography and, and um, multispectral images of each of our first millennium coffins, of which I include these, but we haven't gotten to these yet. We would love to be able to CAT scan them because you can learn so much about how they were constructed. And during this process, Anna and at this point Ahmed go over each piece with a fine tooth comb, um, reverse any conservation um, that has been done in the past that's no longer good for the piece. And, and really just, I mean, conservation is, it's state of the art, but it's also very, um, you want to keep it simple. You always want it to be reversible. You want to make sure any, any flakes are 
you know, pin down properly, and um, but you don't want to do a lot of intervention. So basically, what I can tell you is they're being studied. Again, you can find a lot out from this um, multispectral photography. You do infrared, you do ultraviolet, and you can see. You can study the pigments. You can see. We can X do some portable X-ray. Again, you can see some of the. Um, structure of the pieces, which is really important also for conservation to know how it was built. Um, yeah, so, so it's a, it's a multi-year project. We're in, we're in the process. We've mostly been working on slightly later coffins, but these guys are very much on the agenda. And at the same time, you know, we look at all the other parts of the assemblage. Janice, what year are we talking about? Uh, when, when Winlock? No, the, uh, the actual mummies, the burials themselves. They're around, you know, I'm going to give you exact dates, but around 1,000 BC. Okay. Mm -hmm. And what was the date that they came to the Met? Well, they were excavated in 1924 through you know, the next couple of seasons they did study, and then they came back over the next mm -hmm. couple of years. Mm -hmm. they have, their accession numbers are 1925 and 1926. Mm -hmm. And the Met didn't examine them before this? Yeah, they did. They examined them in Egypt. In Egypt. They're re-examined. They're re-examined. Yes. Yes. I mean, we have tools now that they didn't have then. And again, you know, Winlock un unwrapped the mummies. They didn't have CAT scans. Right. Mm. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> can, can modern DNA help you sort out whose son is whose daughter is whose? Um, so I don't know. It's a good question. Somebody would have to want to do it and and... You know, and again, how good's this ancient DNA stuff they're doing? <laughs> yeah. You know, there are mixed, yeah. mixed reviews yeah. still. So I don't know. Well, yes. Thank you very much.